So for the last number of weeks, we've been in a message series focusing on Old Testament characters and some of the lessons that we can learn from their lives. I began the series with a message that I called Cats in the Cradle, a very personal message to me, um, where I talked about King Josiah and the importance of us destroying a lot of those destructive patterns and behaviors that are often handed to us by our grandparents and our parents. Important to address those in order that we can leave a better legacy for our kids and our grandkids. And then after that, I spoke about a king named Jehoshaphat, and I spoke about the importance of prayer and praise as we engaged the enemy in battle. In that case, it was, I don't know if you remember, but Jehoshaphat sent out the worshipers in the front line of, in this battle, and without any weapons, destroyed the enemy. It was praise that defeated them. And then, of course, last weekend, I spoke about King Nebuchadnezzar and narcissism and the dangers of excessive pride. And so... I hope you were encouraged by those. If you missed any of them, you can watch them online. Pastor Zach puts them up there on oldtownfg.com, so you can watch all of the messages from um, as far as back as, I think, four years. So they're there for you. And we do have a few more messages in this series, but this morning I'm going to be taking a little break to talk about something very important, a life-giving mission that Old Town Church is trying to accomplish in partnership with Africa New Life. Many of you know, if you've been attending here for any length of time, that our last few Easter services, we've collected an offering, but we kept none of it. We gave it all away to Africa New Life for the benefit of two communities in Rwanda, what they call Kajeo A and Kajeo B. Uh, Pastor Zach and I, we had the opportunity to visit these villages last year, and we're able to see firsthand the horrible conditions that these families live in and how desperately they need some of the basic things in life that we often take for granted like food and clean water and clothing and shelter and education man the kids there they love to go to school they want to go to school praise god it's miraculous i mean they love it kids these days you should appreciate that you get to go to school for free but anyway that's a whole nother message okay but the other thing you see while we saw all of all of that, uh, we also were able to see firsthand how the money that many of you offered up on Easter is already making an incredible difference in the lives of the people of Kajeo. I want to show you a quick, it's hardly two minutes long, a video that explains just one of the many ways that you are making a difference in the lives of people across the globe. So let's see if this video works this time. Check this out. Pastor Zach and I took an incredible trip to Rwanda in Africa, where we were able to see the keyhole gardens that our church planted in partnership with Africa New Life Ministries. We learned about all the many vegetables that are grown here, their nutritional value, and how they're impacting the many lives of the people who live in this community. Hi guys, it's Pastor Rudy, and I'm here at Kajeo A at Africa New Life Ministries. And I'm here um, where they have built these keyhole gardens that you have also kindly helped provide for this community. And I'm here to report to you that these are providing a lot of, uh, of quality food for the students who attend school here. Over a thousand children are fed. And what these keyhole gardens do is they provide um, a lot of nutrients that the, the children wouldn't have otherwise with these greens. And they have carrots and beets and they have spinach and, and lettuce, but a lot of great food here that helps these, um, these children have a well-balanced diet. And so the money that we all raised that Easter is going to be able to build 143 of these gardens they, that they expect to be completed maybe by November. And so it's currently, I think there's something like about 40 that have been planted up to this point. So your money has gone a long way to do good in, in this community and it's being extended out further to KJOB. And so I'm really excited to see what's happening here. And I hope you are too. You're making a real tangible difference in the lives of people here in Africa, across the world. And so thank you. Um, I appreciate your support and I'm telling you, so do these wonderful people. Africa New Life is an incredible ministry and we look forward to a long-term partnership with them as we work toward bringing the love of Jesus to the people of Africa. Yes, that's really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yes, you should be thanking yourselves. It's, I really appreciate you guys investing in that. Uh, in, in addition to these keyhole gardens that we're building, the money that we provided with um, last year's offering and, and this year uh, enabled African New Life to build additional keyhole gardens. It also enabled us to fund uh, two of our Old Town church family members uh, for a medical missions trip that they went on just this week. If they, in fact, they're not, I think they're coming back tonight, uh, jo, um, John and Robin Geetson. And so, and, and think, hear this, in just three days in that medical mission trip, they served 611 people in three days. That's, and 18 of those folks got saved and baptized, praise God. So that's awesome. And on top of that, um, Alan Hotchkiss, who's here from African New Life, had, was telling us about how he was explaining to us the shipping costs associated with getting food over there to these folks and what you gave helped to pay for the shipping costs that would provide what is essentially about a year's worth of food for the students who attend that school. So we're making an incredible difference. And I want you to know that God is pleased with that offering that you gave out of your, your resources and your finances. Um, I love the way the message version of the Bible translates these words from Jesus that will be spoken to those faithful folks who met the needs of those less fortunate. This is from Matthew chapter 25, verses 34 through 36, where it says this, the king will say to those on his right, enter you who are blessed by my father. Take what's coming to you in this kingdom. It's been ready for you since the world's foundation. And here's why, because I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was homeless and you gave me a room. I was shivering and you gave me clothes. I was sick and you stopped to visit. And I was in prison and you came to me. In these verses, Jesus is saying that when we are meeting the needs of those that are described here in these verses as being less fortunate that we are, that it's like we're doing those things for him. And in just a bit, I'm going to give you another opportunity to do just that. But before I make that appeal to you, I want to very briefly talk about a subject that is very, very important, but that is often neglected by pastors, including myself to a certain degree. And that subject is giving. Specifically, I want to talk about Tithing. Uh, the word tithe literally means it's like an Anglo Saxon word that I don't have up there, but it, it means a tenth. And in Christian circles, the tithe speaks of the offering of 10% of your income for the purposes of building up God's kingdom. Is that on gross or net? 10% of your income income. That's the tithe. I know that some of you, um, when I just said that, started to tighten up. You're like, oh gosh, really? We came today of all days <laughs> when the guys with the signs and then tithing? Gosh. Surely Jesus must be, you know. Anyway. <laughs> but before you check out or think that I'm about to lay a heavy, heavy guilt trip on you? I'm not. In fact, I'm hoping to do the opposite. Because I believe the truth that I'm going to share with you this morning is going to... See, now you're, he's leaving. I'm talking about tithing. <laughs> Quick, run. <laughs> I think the truth that I'm about to share with you... <laughs> is actually going to set many of you free to give like you've never given before. Now, you're going to have to stick with me because I'm at a, I've tried to take what is a very, very complicated topic and try to break it down to its most basic form. And it, was, it, took, asthma, it just took a lot, a lot of time and a lot of thought and prayer, okay? But you're going to have to stick with me. And some of you who've, who've been in church for a long time might wrestle with what it is that I'm about to share with you, but please don't close your ears or your eyes or your mind to it, okay? A lot of things we've accepted without having really, 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 really investigated it for ourselves. We've taken what somebody said, hold it as gospel without done doing the necessary work of studying God's word, okay? 
So, so here's, the, here's the, the rub for me, is I think that too many people often give, throw money in a bucket, because they're made to feel guilty. That's why you see Sarah McLaughlin with the dogs that are crying with tears running down their eyes. And I don't even know dogs can cry, but apparently they can in that commercial. You know, and they're trying to make you feel so guilty that you'll finally pay uh, to set some of those dogs free. Okay? It's a tactic that works pretty well. Uh, and in many churches around the world, people use that tactic. Uh, I don't know if you've been in a church like this, but some pastors will actually teach their congregants, church family, that if they don't give 10% of their income, that they're told that they're robbing God. And because of that, they're under a curse. Anybody ever heard that before? And they'll use an Old Testament scripture like Malachi 3 to back up that claim. This is what Malachi 3 says. Now imagine me at offering time reading this to you, okay? You, and with this tone of voice, (laughs) you have cheated me of tithes and offerings due to me, saith the Lord. You, therefore, are under a curse. For your whole nation, your whole church has been cheating me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. I know, my bank account, right? Man, if you, say, if you say that to a congregation, of course they're going to give. They're going to be emptying out their wallets and their purses and turning Timmy upside down, their kids shaking out whatever <laughs> lint and pennies are in his pockets. Right? So, and so the fear tactic, does, it is effective. But my question is, is fear or guilt the right motivation for giving? And more importantly... Is that what the Bible teaches? That you and I are obligated to give God 10% of our income uh, income or otherwise suffer the consequences. Um, I have studied this topic for a long time, this topic of tithing. For a year and a half, probably all more than that, but at least about a year and a half studying this topic, both sides, for and against it, and everything in between, man. And the conclusion that I have come to, and that I believe is backed up by the scriptures, is that the tithe, at least how it's often presented to people, tithe is just a small part of an old system of laws and commandments and animal sacrifices and feasts and festivals and ceremonial requirements that were attached to an old covenant that is no longer in effect because through his death and through his resurrection, Jesus Christ has enacted a new and better covenant founded on better promises. Okay, so what is a covenant? What is a covenant? All right, well, basically, a covenant, it's a contract. It's a contract that is founded on promises and expectations and stipulations and responsibilities that two parties agree to. If there's a failure to meet those obligations and those requirements on either side of that deal, then the covenant is broken, and there are usually consequences for doing so. Okay, well, in the case of God... And the Israelites, he wanted to make a covenant with them so that they would become his own special people, or as he describes here in the scripture in Exodus, that they would become his prized possession. He wanted that relationship with them. And all that the Israelites had to do to maintain that covenant relationship with God was to faithfully and completely, underline completely, totally obey a very, very long list of laws and commandments. There was something like 613 of them, and then if you read the book of Numbers, there's all these weird ceremonies that are added onto this. It's a bunch of stuff that they had to commit to. And the Israelites, for whatever reason, felt like, yeah, we can do all of those things, every single one of them. And so then they signed on the dotted line. How do you think that worked out for them? It didn't work out well at all. If you watched uh, Ten Commandments, you know that before Charlton Heston came down the mountain, they were already bowing down to that golden calf. They, 
it didn't work out well at all. See, because they proved to be just as sinful, just, God bless you, as jacked up and in need of forgiveness as we are. Just as much in need of God's grace as we are. But the problem for them back in the day was that Jesus, the one who would eventually set us free from sin, the consequences of the curse, uh, he wouldn't come to this earth for another 1,500 years. So what were they going to do about the sin and the guilt associated with it? Well, God had a solution, a temporary one, and it was this system of like sacrifices and sin offerings and tithes and complicated rituals that he put in place so that when God's people inevitably broke a commandment, that they would be able to experience some release of guilt, although it was only temporary. And it's within that system that the tithe came into practice. Okay, why did the tithe come into practice? Okay, the tithe was essentially, follow me here, this is important, the tithe was essentially a tax on the Israelites in order to compensate a group of men called the Levites, I'm not even going to go into all that, just a group of men called the Levites, who helped the priests perform all of the duties that were associated with these sacrifices and offerings, okay? They were called the Levites, and we see their job description in Numbers chapter 8, verse 19, where it says this, God says, I have assigned the Levites to Aaron and his sons, essentially they are the priests, okay? That's read priests there. I have assigned the Levites to the priests, and they, the Levites, will serve in the tabernacle on behalf of the Israelites and make sacrifices to purify the people. That was their job, again, associated with that. And um, in Numbers 18.21, we see the purpose of the tithe. Look at what the tithe is and who it goes to. Uh, this is Numbers 18.21. God says, I'm giving the Levites... I'm giving the Levites all the tithes of Israel as their pay for the work that they do. So again, the tithe was instituted by God to fund the work of a specific group of people called the Levites who helped the priests perform all of these very complicated sacrifices and ritual ceremonies that were necessary under the old covenant to temporarily cleanse people from their sin. Okay, well... Here's the great news. That old system of sacrifices and feasts and festivals and legal requirements of the law and sin offerings and all those complicated rituals were replaced by a new and better covenant that, as I said, was enacted by Jesus, which we read about in Hebrews chapter 10. This is, man, read all of Hebrews chapter 10. It's awesome. Under the old covenant, The priest stands and he ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, but could never take away sin. It was just a temporary setup that was always going to be replaced. God knew this before he even created the world, that it would be replaced by Jesus Christ. It's just a shadow. But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. And then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. It is finished. So when Jesus, our high priest, offered himself as a perfect sacrifice for sin, good for all time, he once and for all put away this whole system of sacrifices and all of the legal requirements of the law that were attached to it, including the command to tithe. And I think it's very, very important for us to understand that because any pastor who tries to enforce the tithe as some sort of command, what they're doing is they're really obligating people to obey the whole law. We are not allowed to just pick and choose whatever laws we want to obey, just like the Israelites. It's all or it's nothing. And what does Paul say? Everyone who doesn't obey everything in the law is under a curse. But thankfully, Jesus has set us free from the law and the curses that were associated to it. So you're not under a curse. Some of you don't tithe anyway. You're not under a curse. 
Okay, so trust me, I know. I don't know who does it, but I just know that not everybody's giving. You're not under a curse. Okay? So, and let me start wrapping this up. So am I saying that we shouldn't give? No. Every Sunday, my wife writes a check, makes an offering out of the abundance that God has blessed us with and he's entrusted us with. We do that because we're excited about all of the many ways that Old Town Church is trying to meet the spiritual and physical needs of people here in our community as well as around the world in Kajao. So we're pumped about that and so we gladly invest in it. It takes money, a lot of money, to facilitate all of the ministries that this church is trying to do from the, the clothing closet to, to the, um, well, think of all the things we do, the, ho- the homeless shelter that we do, and all of that costs money. So, of course, we want you to join us in supporting that. But what I'm trying to do, and what I'm committed to doing is setting you free from giving out of a sense of fear or guilt or shame or some legalistic obligation to an old covenant requirement so that you can give from a heart of joy and freedom and grace and above all else, love. Giving is a spiritual reflex of the heart that grows in proportion to our understanding of the generous love that Christ has poured out for us. Let me repeat that again. Giving is a spiritual reflex of the heart that grows in proportion to our understanding of the generous love that Jesus demonstrated toward us. Man, somebody should tweet that. I actually wrote that myself after thinking a long time. I always quote everybody else. But here's what I mean by that, okay? (laughs) This is what I mean by that. There's a beautiful story in Luke chapter 7. I can't tell you the whole story. I just have to give you kind of the cliff notes here. But it's a story that, about a woman who gives a very, very expensive gift to Jesus. The story begins in verse 36 of Luke 7, where it says this. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with them, and so Jesus went to his home, and he sat down to eat. When a certain immoral, uh, sinful woman from that city heard that Jesus was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive, expensive perfume. Well, then she knelt beside him at his feet, weeping. And her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. And then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. That's a very beautiful image. Why is that woman weeping? Why is she weeping as she poured out this expensive perfume on the head and on the feet of Jesus? Why? Well, because it was a response to his love for her. And what did the Pharisees and the disciples do? If you read some parallel accounts of the story, what did they do? They looked down on that woman with, with disgust, in, in, in essence. They, they looked at what she was doing and said, what, what a waste, they said. Why is she doing that? What a waste. Look at all that money could have been spent on. What a waste that she would pour out that expensive perfume on Jesus. And because of their selfish, twisted attitude, Jesus told them a parable. That was, interestingly, uh, about money. And you know the story. Two men owed money. One owed 500 pieces of silver. One owed 50 pieces of silver. Some guys kind of say, you know what, just forget about it. I'm setting you both free from that, that uh, c- commitment. So let it go. And then Jesus asked the question, so which of these two guys is going to be more grateful, more full of love toward that forgiving debtor? And the Pharisee goes, uh, I guess the guy who was forgiven a lot. He goes, yeah. And let me tell you something, he says. In the same way, I'm telling you, her sins, this woman, though they are many, they've been forgiven. And so she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven, or at least thinks they only need to be forgiven a little, only shows a little bit of love. And then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. What what I get out of the story is that 
I believe that it's only to the degree that we see how sinful and how desperately in need of God's grace that we are and grasp how generous God has been in lavishing grace and love upon us that we will begin to show that same generous love toward God and toward others. Love gives. Love gives. We know what real love is. This is 1 John 3.16. Because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. And then John gives an example of what that looks like. And it looks like giving. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let's show the truth by our actions. And then our actions, he says, will show that we belong to the truth so that we will be confident when we stand before God. Again, love gives God so loved that he gave his one and only son. How we give is a reflection of our love. If we're not giving much, there's something wrong. And that's why Jesus said that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's a heart issue. And so it so where is your treasure directed? I was talking last week about that narcissistic king and uh, how we can tend to be narcissists and how, I only touched on it briefly, but that the, the cure for a narcissistic, selfish heart is to give to others. Not being self-centered, but being others-centered. So where is your treasure being directed and how are you managing the resources that God has blessed you with. You know, it all belongs to him. He gave it all to you and to me, all the resources and talents and gifts and time, all that. He gave that to us. We're only stewards of it. Are we holding it selfishly for ourselves, hoarding it, or giving it away? When Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. But that, that sinful woman, Jesus was there. She was able to demonstrate her love for him in the pouring out of that expensive perfume. He was there. She was able to do that. We don't have the luxury because Jesus is not presently with us in the physical form, but you know what we can do? We can do what you see there in Matthew 25. When you give food to someone who's hungry, you're doing it for him. When you're putting a roof over somebody's head, it's like you're doing it for him. So we can, in essence, pour out our little alabaster jars and lavish it upon those who so desperately need to see the love of Christ demonstrated not just in word, but in action. So what is my appeal to you? We have 125 children. Well, actually only 100 now, I think, <laughs> because the last service took care of 25. 100 children who need sponsors, some of them desperately. Well, some you'll see there's little stickers on their cards that are out there in the foyer area and in the coffee shop with a sticker on it because these are special cases where they've either lost a sponsor or they've been waiting a long time for one. Pastor Zach and I both were over when we were in Africa and when we saw the conditions that people were living in, I didn't call Charlene to ask her permission. I didn't pray and ask God if I should. In that moment, me and Zach and our families, we sponsored each of us a, a little girl it's a wonderful thing to know that you're making a difference in the life of somebody across the world. And you're going to have that opportunity to do that this morning. And what we're going to do is Zach and I are going to be taking a trip in March. Whoever sponsors a kid, me and Zach are going to go visit and meet them and take video of them. So this way you'll be able to see that the, this is this, the kid, the child on the card, is a real person with real needs. And you get to make a real difference in their lives. The cost is 39 bucks, which covers the expense of their school and their clothes, and their, there's other things with that. You can send them, uh, you can pay for their, them to have food and, or a goat. <laughs> there's a lot of things that you can do for them. 39 bucks a month. You know why I didn't pray? And I, Again, I didn't ask Charlene's permission to pray because I spend 39 bucks on dumb, lame stuff that is here today and gone tomorrow. I eat $39 like a day worth of food, all right? And so... <laughs> <laughs> so seriously, we think, God, if, what do you think you're gonna, is God's going to say when you ask him? Well, I've got to go home and pray about it first. 
he's going to give you the same answer. Yeah, you should do that. So I'm going to close by inviting my friend Anj to come on up here. She is, um, well, actually, you might have seen her on videos that we posted. Me and Zach were singing a song with her when we were over there in Rwanda. She's a wonderful, talented young lady singer. But she's also a beneficiary of uh, sponsorship and what African New Life has done in her life. And so I want her to share uh, briefly here what it is that's been her experience with African New Life. Man. So, all right, sister, you got this? Yeah. All right, go for it. Good morning. Uh, I'm so happy to be here and to be in this church. It's a privilege to stand before people that impacted my life. I am so happy. Um, wow, well, I'm going to go back a little bit before I made African New Life Ministry, uh, where I was, wow, well, a little bit, life was hard, really hard. I. I, ha I live in a family of seven people. I have both parents, and I am the second born. And I am 21 years old. I'm in my university. I'm doing social work and administration. Yeah, so I grew up in a family of a father who was so abusive to my mom. And he couldn't really take his responsibility to take us to school, whereas my mom tried hard and she did what she could to take us to school and she took me to school and I was in grade one and where her financial was really you know sloping down and she was like yeah go home because I can't I can't take you to school anymore so I had to go home and sit and I remember I turned seven years old. That was 2005 when she just heard somewhere about African New Life Ministry. And she just heard someone saying that they're just registering children, you know, to get sponsored and go back to school and to get an education. And then she took us, they took a picture, and then probably... I got uh, you know, a chance to show different pictures outside. Maybe that's where my picture was, you know. And then I had to wait. I, ha I waited like two semesters, that makes maybe six months. And then I got sponsored. And that was the first thing I've ever, you know, my mom was so happy. She was like, yeah, you can go to school. But still, I, c I could go to school, but with, you know, hunger, you know, hungry, you come home, you're hungry from school, but there's no food. And I'm so happy that you guys are doing a great job by, you know, giving food to Kajio A and Kajio B. It's great because I could, you know, hear my sponsor saying that your sponsor, you know, sent a food for month. And I could be, you know, I will celebrate because... I could go to school, you know, because I got breakfast, maybe. So I won't get lunch, but I will get dinner, you know. It was a great time. Yeah, so African New Life continued to support me, you know, and until I go to high school. And then high school, still the life was really hard because, you know, to live with a father who abused you and, you know, you the whole night you are awake, and then you have to go to school. Sometimes you have to run away from home because it was a fight. And then you go to your you know, friend and then you tell him, I need to sleep here at least. And then you go to school. It was hard. But, you know, God knew what was going to happen. And I believe that he was my father at that time. He knew that I will make African New Life Ministry, you know. And then in high school, in grade eight, I decided you know, to take a step and do something for my family. You know, in Rwanda, um, in the wedding, there's, they just hire a troupe to come and entertain, to do traditional dance. You dance, they give you money. So I was like, I have to join that and then get some money and start to pay rent for my family and start to, you know, buy some little needs at home. And at grade eight, it wasn't really easy. 
as a child to, you know, start support your family rent. You know, it wasn't easy. So I started to do that. <laughs> and I could see a letter of my sponsor and she could say every time, I love you and I pray for you. I, seriously, I don't remember other words she wrote, but those two words, I remember them. So I could read them and I feel like something was happening in my life. So, and a li letter when I just, I was, I was in grade, in grade six, maybe, yes, that when we could go to center days where African New Life would just call or sponsor the kid to come together, you know, you have fellowship, you talk, you have friends. So I said to get relieved with the hatred I had for my father, you know, being lonely. And then at that time, I just got to know God when I was in grade, like, maybe grade nine. Yes, grade nine. Then I got baptized, I got saved, but I had to hide it from my dad because he, he will kill me <laughs> if I tell him that I am saved. You know, he will be like, what is that? That is for old, you know, old people, and you're still young. So I got saved, and African New Life helped me to know God, and it helped me to know who I, I, I am and even now, and it helped me to know that I can do better and I, I deserve, you know, great things and I had hope at that time. So uh, I remember when I finished high school, I graduated from high school, it wasn't easy, you know, to know that I graduated. Now, what's next after high school? So what am I going to do? Then in that time, I had to ask African Youth Ministry to, you know, to work with me. And I started, you know, a business of selling tea to the student so that I could get money. At that time, it was, you know, hope was still coming that now I'm going to get a little bit, you know, shift my family from where we were to another place, you know. And, you know, it was still hard to do something when your father still, you know, you're paying rent, but you don't sleep in that house because he's always fighting, so you need to run away, you know. So it wasn't easy. So in high school, still life wasn't good, and then graduating, and then I was like, I need to ask if I can volunteer and get volunteer work in African Youth Ministry because I could feel like I want to give back, you know. They helped me to go to school, so I need to give back to them, I need to serve. So then I asked them and then they were like, you can work at reception. That was a great position. At that time, I worked at reception and then I was like, I, I need to serve God. Then I joined worship team and, you know, I served, I didn't know even that I, I could sing, but it just happened and I believe it was the calling of God. So. I joined worship team and then I sang, you know, I could do reception -y, and then I go to school and then I, Sunday I go to church. And then my father was like, uh, where do you go every Sunday, every Friday? I think, you know, he felt like something because he couldn't provide for home. He couldn't, you know, do anything, but he could find food at home. He could just come and sleep, no quarrels, and he was like, I, I bet that he was thinking that I always fight, but everyone loves me. So he was like, I need to come to church. And I was like, yes, you can come. But the condition was, you need to buy for me one beer, and then I come to church. Wow. It was something, you know, and I was like, okay, dad. Because I think he was expecting that, you know, I am rich, so... Everything he wants, I'm going to provide for him. So I was like, yes, that one beer on Sunday, and then you come to church. So sometimes you f I, I could forget, and then he was like, I don't have to come, because I didn't come because you didn't give me one beer, and that was the promise. Yeah, so life continued like that, you know. It, it was hard, but I am so happy that through African New Life, I just... I said, 
I was a bridge to my siblings, you know. They had a trust in me. They trust in me, you know. They can't go to mom and dad and ask something, but they come to me. And through African New Life, I was sponsored, and then I went to school, and then now I am helping even my siblings to go to school. It's really amazing, and <laughs> I'm so happy. Yeah. Uh, last year, and I went to Germany to serve, you know, and that child who was hopeless, didn't have, you know, life, now I am just traveling in different world and now I am working with African New Life Ministry as an administration and operation manager assistant. And you know, if it wasn't my sponsor, you know, to come at that time, maybe my picture also was there where other pictures are and pick me. I couldn't be here. I couldn't be traveling in different world and you know, serving God doing something. So I feel like through Africa New Life Ministry, there's impact, you know. And I want to convince you that what you're doing, it's not in vain, you know. Sponsoring one kid, it's, it's a second generation you're raising. So, and I can't forget this. In high school, before I joined high school, uh, there's a program of Esther College program and it supports girls to go to school, to go to university. And I'm so happy that my sponsor is here. It's Catherine and, <laughs> oh my God, I'm so, I'm so excited that Steve and Kathy, they're here and they're my sponsor. I don't know, on your own, you can't stand up and see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, they're here. Yeah, it's, a, it's actually a privilege that they're here and, you know, they were a vessel, you know, of God to take me to university and now I'm about to graduate, you know, I'll get a degree as, you know, other blessed child and girls and women who loves God. So it's a privilege to have them in my life. And, you know, and I bet they're, you know, uh, I try, when I go to school, I'm like, I want to make them proud because they're the one who took me from where I was and still now. So I want to thank you for deciding to help Rhonda and letting us dream. It's not in vain. And I know God will bless you. And thank you for making me who I am. And thank you, Kathy, for what you're doing in my life. And thank you, Steve. Thank you so much.